All right, so we'll go ahead and get started with the next, uh, next talk. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our two speakers, uh, Dr. Vijay Gadapale and uh, Dr. Tim Wheel. Um, they're going to talk to you about uh, Graphilo, uh, which is a graph analytics framework atop Apache Accumulo. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, uh, for the introduction. So we're very excited to be here. Uh, over the past year, year and a half, uh, we've been developing a tool that we call Graphilo, which is essentially graphs in a Accumulo. Uh, so we're, we're excited to bring this to the community over here, uh, but more importantly, to hear your feedback when we're done. So we'll, you know, we'll hang around for the, for the day after this, but we really want to hear what directions you all are going in. So as we develop this software and move from you know, version one to two, we get to hear what, uh, what you have to say and what you have to, what you have to think. So I'm going to start off with a little bit on the background on, on graphs and the mathematics behind Graphilo, and then I'm going to switch it over to my colleague, Dr. Tim Wheel, uh, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about how to actually use this. So he, he's, uh, he actually has code in there. I've got very few equations, I promise. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about graph mathematics and then Graphilo. So how many people here use Accumulo? That's good, okay, people are awake, except for a crowd over there. Um, but graph algorithms is a very popular thing to do with, with Accumulo. So what you do is you represent your data set. This could be social media, it could be ISR, it could be cyber data. You represent it as a graph. And a graph is essentially a structure that represents relationships between entities. So ISR, which stands for Intelligence, Surveillance, or Reconnaissance, you might uh, represent entities and relationships through multi-int uh, multi sources. Uh, you might have thousands to millions of tracks, and your goal in this particular, in an ISR graph algorithm or application, may be to search for anomalous patterns of life. Is there a track in a place where there isn't supposed to be a track or vice versa? In a social network, uh, this is something that we're probably very familiar with. We see a lot of this on a daily basis. We might represent relationships between people or users on a social platform, and you might have even tens of millions of different entities. And we might be looking in, in, in some of our applications, look for hidden social networks or find out where there is bad behavior or bad communities that are being formed. And in cyber, which is an area that uh, I know our group works a lot on, uh, is to represent communication patterns in a network and maybe look for anomalous behavior. Is there, again, data going out of something that there shouldn't be data going out of or data coming into something that there really shouldn't be data coming into? Or is there a different pattern than what we've seen before? So we use graph analytics in many, many missions to solve a variety of problems. Now, one of the natural things that you know, we've been looking at is Accumulo is used to store so much data. It has extremely high performance. And over the past few years, I've actually presented some of the work that we've been doing in developing different interfaces to Apache Accumulo. So the data is already in Accumulo. All this graph data is stored in Accumulo. And the traditional way of processing this is to take the data out. So you pull it across a thin, narrow pipe put it onto your local system, which often has less resources than where the data was originally stored. You do the processing, then you take the results and put it back into Accumulo. That seems a little bit against the paradigm that we're moving to, right, of trying to get compute to data rather than data to compute. So that's one thing that we looked at, is how to take, make use of a lot of the infrastructure that Accumulo already provides us. Accumulo does some great parallel processing. Uh, why not leverage that to actually do computation directly in Accumulo? So you get data locality, you get to do the processing where the data sits, you get to reuse the infrastructure, you've already spent resources in, in, in setting up your Accumulo in instances in your infrastructure, try to use that, and you get a number of free database features. Uh, you get quick uh, indexing and querying of data, fast access, and Tim will talk to you a little bit about how this fast access looks, as well as the distributed execution that Accumulo iterators provide you. So this is sort of our goal, how to do graph graphs on Accumulo. Now, as you've probably heard, there's been a lot of work. This is not the first time that somebody's thought about doing graph algorithms in Accumulo, right? There's a lot of work. Of course, a lot of people develop their applications and put them in Accumulo. So what we wanted to do was develop not only the ability to do the graph algorithms in Accumulo, but to take that one step further and to allow you to develop these algorithms against some sort of a spec or some sort of an abstraction layer that allows you to write algorithms separately from infrastructure. And now what you'll see later when Tim's talking about some of our future work, this means that you as an algorithm developer in the crowd only needs to learn some of the mathematical specifications of what we're using. And when you actually, and you can write your algorithms on and as we update Graphilo, that should be transparent to you. So you get to write to a spec and we write to. So what we want to do is decouple database designers from algorithm developers. 
right? They have very different skill sets. Both are extremely valuable, but we don't want to have the same person trying to do an extremely vertical all the way from the math to the actual, well, how is my data actually stored on disk, right? So we want to separate those communities from each other. So some of the research that we've been doing at MIT, we've looked at graphs, of course, and we've noticed that there's this natural duality between graphs and sparse matrices. And for those of you who are familiar with graphs, you'll know that a graph, which is the representation on your uh, left, uh, can be represented as a sparse matrix, and one such sparse matrix representation could be an adjacency matrix representation. And the adjacency matrix of a graph is essentially imagine your rows and your columns being the two verte vertex labels, and a dot or a weight with, between them can represent a connection between two different vertices. So this is one representation of a graph as a sparse matrix. Now you might be wondering, well, why do we want to do things as sparse matrices? Graphs look cool, they make a lot more sense. Why would I represent it as a matrix? I hate math, right? Or I hate, I hate linear algebra, I guess. There are a lot of people who fall in that camp. Um, what we've also noticed is that these sparse matrices have a natural duality with accumulo tables. And what we've talked about over the past few years, talking about D4M and some of these tools, is schemas to take your unstructured data that comes to you in a text file that you stored in a, and that you'd like to store in a cumulo, and how to actually store it in a method that allows you to take your data that looks like a sparse matrix and store that in a cumulo as an actual accumulo table. So in this particular example, our adjacency matrix can be written as a one-to-one -one relationship with an accumulo table. And this is a standard old accumulo table. So what this really means is that we have this one-to-one -one relationship between graphs, matrices, and accumulo tables. So that means that if we can do mathematics on matrices, that is equivalent to doing math on tables, or on graphs, or math on accumulo tables. And that brings us to the next piece when I talked about coming up with a specification We've been working with a community called the Graph Blas community. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Blas, which stands for the Basic Linear Algebra Subprograms, it's actually an effort that was done to speed up a lot of the core mathematical processes uh, that was used in dense linear algebra. Over the past few years, we've been looking at how to do that for sparse linear algebra as well. And that's through an effort called the Graph Blas. So this, is rep this community is represented by a number of people at different organizations, including hardware manufacturers such as Intel uh, and NVIDIA. And what this community is really interested in is what are the core operations that people need to do so when we design hardware, we can speed it up. Right, so if I can represent all my algorithms as matrix multiplications, as example, a hardware developer can say, oh great, I can do that, right? I can do a fast matrix multiplication. And that's the aim of the graph plus community. So there's a lot of great material in the book of how to actually take very common and popular graph algorithms and represent them as linear algebraic operations. And for those who are interested in this topic, I'd, I'd encourage you to take a look at the book. And what the graph plus community did was basically be able to determine, and we've, we've been a large part of this, of taking very popular graph algorithms and saying, hey, there are really only about 10 mathematical operations that you need to do to actually represent a very wide variety of graph algorithms. And so that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to remove the, net, remove the dependence that people often have with building these graph algorithms of understanding what was in the thinking of the person who wrote the, who wrote the library in the first place, but instead, use graph blas as a stat natural starting point for the graphilo mathematics. So this is the initial function list. I won't go into the details of this. However, if you'd like to know more about this community or the way it's moving, please find either myself or Tim after this. Uh, it suffices to say that there's really a large number of graph algorithms that you can write using just these 10 operations. And really it's the top three that are the most important. So matrix multiplication, so sparse matrix multiplication, and sparse matrix, sparse vector, or sparse matrix dense vector multiplication. So at this point, you're probably thinking, well, okay, this is great. You've just given us a math lesson here. Did not wake up early enough for that. Um, so what we're trying to do is bring this graph plus functionality to Cumulo. And here's an example of something you can do. Uh, many people here have probably heard of a breadth first search. A breadth first search is essentially you're on different vertices and you'd like to know what's connected to these different vertices. And a multiple source breadth first search means I've got multiple seed vertices and I'd like to look for what's connected to each of these different vertices. Right? Sounds like a useful analytic, right? We want to find out, we know these users are bad, I want to know who's connected to these users, for example. So it turns out that you can represent multiple source breadth first search as a single matrix vector operation. 
Uh, so if you take A transpose, which is basically a flipped version, and in this case A stands for the adjacency matrix of the graph, B is a vector that contain, that's basically zero except for the positions where you'd like to start, so the seed vertices, and the multiplication of those two together gives you a result, which is A transpose multiplied by B, that the non-zero entries of that result are the vertices that are connected to these initial seed vertices. So that's really useful, because we can do matrix vector multiplication pretty quickly, uh, and that's one of the graph blas functions as well. So the sparse array representation gives us space efficiency. The sparse matrix matrix multiplication can be work efficient, and in fact, this is something as this specification goes out to the community and gets more buy-in, we're hoping that more hardware manufacturers will develop uh, will develop tools for this. And in fact, something we've been developing at MIT Lincoln Lab is on developing actually a specialized graph processor that can do this at orders of magnitude times faster than a conventional CPU. People have done great work in developing ASICs and FPGAs as well to do these type of operations. And we've also been able to use this as a basis for a wide range of graph algorithms. So again, I will not go into these, but what we wanted to say is that there are a number of different classes, and this is not meant to be an exhaustive list of graph algorithms, but there are a number of different graph algorithm classes, uh, and we've actually gone through and actually been able to rewrite a lot of these graph algorithms using just the graph blas kernel. So just using matrix matrix multiplications or matrix vector operations, we're able to actually uh, write a lot of these graph problems. So there are a lot of graph problems that might be difficult to write as graph blas, but usually within each algorithm class, there is a good algorithm that can be well written. And you get a lot of efficiency with that. When you can do sparse matrix vector operations or sparse matrix matrix operations, you get a lot of work efficiency that you can, you can get from it. So now let's leave the math aside and let's talk about what we're doing in Accumulo specifically and how it matters to you. Uh, so we've not only been able to develop the ability to do these graph blas kernels in Accumulo, uh, but we also want, we understand that people store their data in Accumulo in different ways. Uh, and we don't want to make you have to translate, you know, there's a lot of tools that like, hey, you, you know, you can use our tool as long as you change everything that you do, right? We, we tried not to do that. So in talking to some members of the community, we found that there are three broad classes, and this is something that we definitely are looking for your feedback. If there are other ways that you already represent your data, we'd like to support it. But we found out that a lot of people represent their data using either adjacency matrices, which is the example that I gave you before, what's called an edge or incidence matrix, depending on the community that you're in. Some people use a single table schema as well. And these are just three, what we found, popular ways to store data. So we wanted to make sure that our, the Graphulo algorithm, or the Graphulo mathematics, work on these three different types of graph structures, and we hope to expand this to more that the community is interested in. So one thing that we should note is that when we store data in Accumulo, and this is similar to how we use D4M, uh, we store data using the row ID, the column qualifier, and the value. So you'll see this later on. When I say column, I'm really referring to the column qualifier. So you could add additional data into the visibility or family. And in fact, I think a couple of talks from colleagues uh, later on in the session uh, will talk to you a little bit about how to use some of those type of labels for, uh, for protecting your data uh, and, and talk a little bit about the security aspects of it. So the adjacency schema, which is probably our most supported schema right now, basically takes in the row, so that's the row ID, we store the starting node label. Uh, in this example over here, it's a number. We're just using uh, number as a row label, but it could be anything. Uh, your column qualifier is the end node label, so that's sort of vertex one, vertex two, which is the column, and the value is an edge weight. So this can be used to represent weighted uh, directed graphs. The, what we also store very often is what's called a degree table. And a degree table is really about, it's a collapsed version of the adjacency table that stores information about how popular or unpopular particular nodes are. So a degree can be an in degree, which is the number of edges that are coming into a particular vertex, or an out degree, which is the number of edges that are going out of a vertex. Uh, and that's in a directed graph. In an undirected graph, you might just have degree only, which is the total number of edges incident upon a vertex. Uh, so in the degree table, the row is the node label. The column qualifier is just, the wor is, is just a fixed degree label. Uh, so either in or out, or it could just be degree if it's undirected. Uh, and the value is the actual degree. So in this particular case over here, it shows that vertex 1 has an in degree of 1,084. That means there are 1,084 different edges going into vertex 1. 
Another schema that we use is what's called the incident schema. Now the incident schema is actually a little bit more flexible in terms of the type of data. So you can do not only weighted uh, and directed graphs, but you can do also what are called multi and hyper graphs as well. And in, in an incidence matrix or an incident schema, what you're doing is you're storing the row as the edge label. So that means for each edge, you have an individual row. And the column qualifier is essentially an edge direction prefix plus separator and node label. And this is in the schema we're using. Uh, and the value is the edge weight, similar to the adjacency matrix. So in this particular case, we have edge label 0001 that's going in to vertex 907, and it has a weight 2. So you can see how you can actually probably reconstruct the adjacency matrix from the incidence matrix, actually just a multiplication with itself. Uh, and then we also have, a sim as similar to before, a degree table that has the same structure as in the adjacency matrix. And finally, there's another schema that we've noticed some people in the community using, which is what's called a single table schema. So in the previous two examples, we have edges and degrees and vertices stored in different tables. You might just store everything in a single table for whatever reason, right? And so in this case, what you're doing is the degree row is a node label, and if your column qualifier has the word degree, then the value is the out degree of the node. And similarly, if you want to store the edge information, your row is the out node label plus separator plus an in node label, and the qualifier is the word edge, and the value is the edge weight. Find us if you want more information on this. Uh, this might be a little bit much. Um, so with that, uh, with a little bit of the background, I'm going to hand it over to uh, my colleague, Tim. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to present uh, where we are in terms of our prototype, the actual implementation of these concepts, and give you uh, an understanding on where we want to go and start the dialogue between um, what we've done and where the community sees uh, this work potentially being useful. So um, setting up Graphilo is fairly easy. Um, I'll have a GitHub. Uh, you, it's on GitHub today. You can go download it. I'll give you the URL and a few slides. You can set it up, compile it, install it, you're the jar in your class path in your Accumulo uh, library directory, and restart your Accumulo and uh, use your favorite IDE um, today. So you can have this downloaded by lunch, and by the end, you can tell us all our problems. Um, I'm going to uh, use Java in this example, but we also have um, uh, MATLAB and Octave, which is the open source version of MATLAB integration. Uh, if you, th that's your preferred environment. Um, setting up a Graphilo instance is fairly easy. The uh, Accumulo instance name, your Zookeeper instance name, your Accumulo username, and the password. Um, pass it into Graphilo, and you're ready to go. Um, and so what I'll do now is I'll kind of talk about how we get data in, because without data, you, any of the other processing really doesn't mean anything. So we provide a tr uh, triple file writer, um, which reads the data that you have into the Accumulo um, representation that we set up. So passing in the connection, you then are able to pick uh, whether you want an adjacency, an incidence, or a single table representation. Um, it's fairly, uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, just quickly uh, talk a little bit about the parameters. Um, so the first file is your row information. The second file is your column information. Usually, if it's an adjacency matrix, it'll, this'll, uh, it'll be something like one, and then in the second, it'll, uh, the, the second file, it'll be two um, for an edge from one to two. The third, uh, your values are optional. If you pass it in a null value, it will just default to all ones. If that's what you want, go for it. Your delimiter, so we use examples, uh, we use integers as examples, but we're not limited to that. So if you uh, want to pick, uh, use another delimiter because your uh, rows have columns in it, commas in it, that's great. The base name is the name of the table that you're reading into. We will also do the transpose and the degree tables for you if that is part of your um, schema. Uh, and then options to delete existing tables and track your uh, log the time, uh, ingest time if you're interested in that. For the incidence uh, representation, if you can provide an estimated number of entries, that just helps a little with the input. So once you get your data in, um, we've spent a, long, a lot of time, Dylan in particular, has, uh, this has been a, very much a labor of love for him, um, uh, creating a set of iterators that um, ultimately do uh, 
actually execute the um, graph blahs uh, uh, specification. So you can see table malt uh, element wise multiplication. These things have already been implemented uh, through, uh, through the development effort. If you want additional information, I'll go a little bit into it, but there's a, in the documentation, there's about 120 uh, slide PowerPoint presentation that really gets into it, and uh, we're more than happy to an answer any questions that you may have offline. Um, but this, in, in, this is what allows us to execute the graph blahs functionality in Accumulo through the Graphula library. And so, for example, if we wanted to do a table multiplication, we have the ability to pull the data from the two tables together, align that information, do the multiplication as necessary, and then write that out to this result table um, where it will do a lazy summation um, as uh, resources are available uh, and will give you the final uh, answer that you're looking for. That's all well and good, but um, as, uh, as I stated to uh, Vijay before, um, we're, uh, everything up to here is kind of a cumulo navel gazing. Um, this is interesting, it's very useful, but the power that we see in this as we move forward is really in the implementation of the algorithms on top of this framework. So in our prototype system, uh, we have done some simple uh, initial uh, algorithms as proof of concept. So a breadth first search across the various representations, uh, an elementary uh, vertex vertex similarity measure, and some um, basic uh, graph structure uh, analysis uh, tools that, are, uh, that have been implemented. But this is really where we see a lot of the growth happening in terms of Graphilo. Once, as we've defined these things, as we get the optimization um, through graph blahs, these, these uh, algorithms are really what the developer community uh, will be able to take advantage of as we move forward. Uh, implementing a breadth first search once, you get it across you know, any installation of Graphilo that is out there. So if you don't have a, y, a, a large development shop that can do custom MapReduce, we can get you an 80% solution uh, through this Graphula work at, and just expand on it from there. As it's all mathematically backed, we can um, engage with that community and uh, see the, uh, the software and hardware benefits potentially in the future. So if and when we talk about, well, how do I do something like this in terms of our breadth first, in terms of breadth first search, um, you basically just call the, uh, the adjacency BFS uh, function. There's a lot of options there. A lot of these things can just be nulled um, or set to a default value. Really the minimum thing that you need today in order to get a result from this is to know the table to search, the list of starting vertices, and this can be a multi-source as uh, Vijay's example before, um, and the number of steps you have to take. Uh, optionally, if you want to store the results, if you think that'll be useful in subsequent computation or subsequent um, processing, you give it a result table. If you don't give it a result table, it'll return those values as a string, so buyer beware, depending on the size of your graph. Um, you can do it, uh, it may not be the best idea. Um, but this is where we want, to, we, we see a lot of growth is as these algorithms have been defined, um, mathematically, and we've provided the iterators uh, and the framework to uh, then execute them in Graphilo. We then can now take it to the uh, developer level, really um, to then use the algorithms in the appropriate manner. Um, accessing results, we aren't have we have not to this point created any special Graphilo access methods. Um, just access the data, it's stored in Accumulo, any way you'd access normal Accumulo informa stored information. Um, if there are particular ways you want to access your data, again, let's have that conversation. So the current status, here is where you can download it today, version 1.0. Um, we've done most of our testing in adjacency matrices uh, and that representation. Uh, there's a limited support, uh, and I say that just because I um, I can't promise everything's going to work out of the box in terms of edge and single tables. Um, we're working through some of that. We'd like to hear, um, uh, we'd like to hear your feedback on where we are and what you need in, uh, in terms of that. We have Java and MATLAB integration code. We've also uh, kicked the tires a little bit uh, 
pig is one area, uh, one environment that s some people use. Um, we've also looked a little bit at what would a RESTful interface potentially be for a Graphilo database. Uh, these are areas that, um, you know, just kind of proof of concept. There's code out there. It, uh, I have code out there. It may not be, I wouldn't. Give it, advise anyone to use it, but taking a look at it more of as a, as a thought experiment, um, I can give you those links uh, offline. Uh, since we are working within MIT, uh, we have done research uh, on uh, using this, so comparing our results to a traditional uh, read from the database, do the computation in memory, write that computation back, uh, we were, we've been able to show that um, just in the table multi uh, operation alone, just doing a table multiplication, um, we're able to hit higher rates um, at a greater scale when we don't, aren't memory limited. And so um, this is a uh, um, exponential scale at the bottom, so every time we go up, we double the amount of uh, vertices in the graph. Uh, so we're able to get it uh, to a greater uh, scale. Since we're building on a cumulo, uh, which has known scaling capabilities as you uh, give more resources to it. Um, we wanted to test as to whether or not uh, we also scale. Um, so uh, we see the expected relative speed up um, from one, uh, one node uh, uh, to two nodes to four nodes and so on. We're seeing that linear, uh, that expected speed up as we go, both in terms of the table multiplication and in, if you want to do some data extraction, um, it goes faster. Hooray. Uh, in terms of now getting to the algorithms themselves, uh, looking at uh, actually implementing the Jacquard, uh, at, as before we're seeing a greater scale and a, comparative, uh, a competitive rate with, with other implementations. But we do acknowledge it's a prototype system. As we look at some of, these, some of the other types of algorithms, we have areas for improvement and we're interested, uh, we have some ideas on, on things that we can do to improve in these areas, but, um, uh, um, but there's work to be done. So uh, we'll look for work in the future on this. And if you want to help, we'd love your help. In the future, uh, we will uh, look for uh, initial implementation that we'll call version two. Uh, that's sort of a production ready version, something that you would feel comfortable putting out into a, an enterprise system, even uh, on, a, on a testing variety, but we'd really like to hit a production level. Uh, build the community uh, around Graphilo. I know there's a lot of contributors and people that have learned uh, what to do and what not to do in terms of uh, building these uh, building uh, applications and uh, frameworks. So we'd love to hear those best practices. What are the initial uh, algorithms that the community would see most useful uh, to, uh, uh, to stabilize and to get out there? Uh, where's the documentation so that we're not getting calls at three in the morning uh, that something broke? Uh, how do we get people up and running and stable very quickly? Additionally, you know, just more software engineering ideas um, in terms of scaling, stability, uh, potentially with one uh, in the future expanding to relational algebra, doing that uh, comp uh, performance comparison um, just to, to, if you've got a uh, H-based coprocessor or your own uh, home rolled MapReduce jobs, how do we compare? Are we in the same ballpark? Uh, just to, to kind of get everyone uh, happy with our speed. Uh, and uh, then finally, what are the other environments? Java is a, is a given, but where, where else may people be interested in using graph alg algorithms and Graphilo uh, from the, in the future? I would like to acknowledge the support of the LLSC, the Supercomputing uh, Center at Lincoln Laboratory, without whom we could not have done this work, and then just say thank you. Any questions? Hi. Um, how does it compare to um, Gaffer? Uh, I couldn't see where the question came from. Right there. Oh, okay. That, now I know who I'm looking at. All right. Uh, so we, that's, I think, you know, what Tim mentioned is doing some of the head-to-head -head performance testing. So one thing just as a, as a general, maybe a high-level thought is that one of the big differences that we see with Graphilo versus a lot of the other graph libraries that are out there is this 
conforming to a specification. Uh, so as I've looked at uh, Gaffer, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure there are people in the crowd who are, are bigger experts in Gaffer than I am. Um, it, does, it does a really good job for a certain subset of algorithms. However, if you wanted to implement new algorithms, you'd have to have very deep knowledge of Gaffer and the way that it's architected. Uh, what we want to do is remove that knowledge of how the underlying system, how the iterators work, and all, all the, how that happens. We want you to just write the math down, right? Or, or if, you're, if, if the other thing floats your boat, then do that part of it, but then don't worry about the algorithm piece of it. So that's sort of the fundamental difference, um, just in the way that this library works versus a lot of the other libraries that are out there is writing to a spec. Um, and this is something that we see in hardware and lots of software of having an abstraction layer away from the actual infrastructure. Um, so we don't want things to work vertically, but we'd want you to be able to, everyone can kind of work at their, at their piece. Does that answer your question? But I think in the future, doing some of the head-to-head -head performance would be, would be very interesting to us. Hey, I have about actually three questions. Um, okay. <laughs> why column qualifier and not, I mean, what's the reasoning behind using the column qualifier Granularity. It's uh, it's just we we made a choice on where to put data, you know okay. what we found is the locality group that we wanted to put data in. It in fact gives you one additional layer of locality that you can leverage if you wanted to. That was sort of our choice. Is that we'll sort of use the first thing, and if you have an additional layer uh, that you're already using, good for you. you. Might even be able to get higher performance. But that's sort of the reason that we're doing it. Okay. Uh, second question is: Does your algorithms leverage the cell level securities? Uh, not yet. Uh, that is definitely uh, an area of interest to us. Uh, we, again, you know, there's a couple of talks coming up with Lincoln Laboratory next, so we, we work very closely with the team uh, that does some of the security enforcement in Accumulo, uh, doing some of the research in that area. We have realized that we don't do anything that clashes with it. Uh, however, we've not explicitly uh, done that. Uh, you know, we've not incorporated that into our stack yet. But there is nothing in our design that would stop us. So if somebody's yeah. interested in that uh, and would either like us to do it or would like to help us do it, absolutely that's something we'd be interested in. Okay. The final question is, uh, do you have any APIs to uh, ingest based on the existing tables rather than actually looking into file and getting the vertices in? Yeah, so, I, I, so this is moving data from one table to another. Um, so are you talking about data that's stored already? I mean, so yes, there would be that sort already of, existing data. I don't think we have, that's actually a great, you know, maybe doing that, so that translation is where the challenge would be and you might still have to go via your computer. Um, we don't have anything explicitly that if you have, you know, an arbitrary schema that your data is already stored in that would automatically translate that into one of the schemas over here that's kind of going via your system right now. Um, and, you know, I think one of the challenges with that is coming up with something that's general purpose enough and not super complicated, you might end up with one of those function that has like 80 parameters that you need to fill in, which is you might as well just write the code at that point. Uh, so we don't have anything that does that yet. Uh, although that is, if there, and you know, I think one thing I wanted to ask since this is question answer time uh, and we can ask questions is, are these schemas sufficient that, we're, that we support right now? Are, is there st stuff that people are doing um, that, that we have not covered, because we want to know. We'd, we'd be really interested. We, wanna, we don't want people as much as possible to do, have to do those translations themselves, because that just adds overhead to using this toolbox. However, at the same time, Graphula really needs to understand how the data is stored before you can, otherwise you get unoptimized uh, performance. So we'd like to know what y'all are doing so we can, there's usually a translation, but it's just something that we need to, need to have. So. I don't know if you want to share that now or you can find us later. Yeah. Oh, is that, yeah, those three, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? We probably have time for one more. One on the back there. Back there. Uh, what sorts of capabilities do you support for uh, graphs with labeled edges? Like, for example, could you do like breadth first search? along a prescribed collection of edge labels, things like that. Yep, um, yep, exactly. So uh, the representation that we have in Accumulo is something based on this mathematical concept called associative arrays, which if, the easiest way to think about it, and I know I'm really, this is super high level, but is a sparse matrix with text labels. It's a quick way to think about it. So you can represent labeled edges, labeled vertices, you know, using text. I know the examples we showed here were numbers, but that is really could be anything. Um, so yes.
Um, you were talking about associative arrays and how do you maintain the degree table? Because if you are doing an update, you will increase the degree, but in reality, you just you did not add a node, you just m modified it. Uh, so the way that we do it right now is the degree is computed. Uh, that's something that you're computing as you put in. So that's something that you're, I mean, so we're using the, the addition iterator, uh, but at the same time, that's something that you need to keep track of. So updates should not change it because it's based on the actual label of the data itself. The degree is based on the label. Okay. So we sort of, uh, we found a, a, a big optimization point is to, instead of using the, the call combiner, but to actually batch up things and stick it in, we found that we found that we end up, we can end up with a hotspot if we try to do each entry. So we might batch up 10,000 or 100,000 entries at once. So that's something that you often do locally before inserting. All right. Thank you. Thank you all.